Welcome to the channel. If you're new here, my name's Ryan. I'm a New York City street photographer. And if you're returning to the channel, thanks for coming back and watching. It is a rainy, wet couple of days here in New York City. And I've been out and about a lot in the past, you know, six weeks, two months or so, going into the holiday season. And now that we're in January, you know, sort of coming out of that, I've been out on the streets, making a lot of photos, making a lot of videos, talking you through my process, and I thought I would take the opportunity, since the weather is pretty crap, to talk you through how I edit my photos, specifically how I edit my black and white photos, and even more specifically, how I edit my black and white photos to look and feel like the film work that I do when I'm shooting black and white. So if you end up finding this video helpful, please give it a like, consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, I put out a new video every week, and with that, let's jump right in. So this is gonna be kind of a chill video. I'm gonna sit here, I'm gonna edit on my iPad, and just do a screen recording and talk you through what the process is for editing these photos. Now, I thought it would be probably useful to start with what my objectives are when I am editing these photos, because you know, there's lots of different ways to edit a photo. And the caveat here is that this is how I edit my photos. This is not necessarily how you should edit your photos. This is totally a matter of taste, but I thought, let me talk you through my process, and if there's something that you find useful, you can apply it to yours and then tweak it to your, to your own taste. Everything that we do is subjective, so this is just meant to be a highlight of the way that I think about editing my photos. So, the first thing that I'm trying to achieve when I'm editing any of my photos, whether it's black and white or color, is to take the digital edge off of the image. Uh, I really like the look and feel of more analog photography, and I appreciate the dynamic range and the capabilities from a technology standpoint that we have with digital cameras. So when I'm editing, I'm looking to marry sort of the best of both worlds and create a finished product in the form of a photo that has the look and feel of film, but is able to take advantage of the really amazing sensors that modern cameras have in them today. Now the second piece of this goes with the first. If I'm looking to edit my photos into a sort of filmic look, the first thing that I really care about is the way that the contrast or the, the difference between the highlights and the shadows look and how deep those blacks are and how light those whites are. So the second thing I'm looking to do is to control the amount of contrast in my images with the edit. And then the third, and this goes with the editing, but it also goes with composition. And I, I released a video last week about how I think about composing cinematic images and creating that sense of sort of filmic look in your photos from a composition standpoint and how I think about the light when I am composing. And I'll link that video up here. But in the edit, that's just as important. How can I create and reinforce the composition via the edit and lean into creating a dreamlike or hazy or stark sense of light that emphasizes the composition that I set out to make when I originally took the photo. Now, everything that I do today is going to be in Lightroom, but the same principles apply to Capture One or any other photo editing software that you might be using. I'm gonna do the editing on my iPad because it's a little uh, easier for me to do a screen recording and make it interactive, uh, but I often do most of my editing on my MacBook Pro. It doesn't really matter what you do it on, the, the principles are the same. So I'm gonna be doing a screen recording. The, the first edit that I'm gonna go through is gonna be long and I'm gonna kind of talk you know, in more detail about the first photo. And then I'm gonna bang through you know, another two or three at the very end of the video really quickly, you know, use some of the presets that I've got already built, tweak them a little bit. Um, the foundation of everything that I'll be doing is gonna be exactly the same, but I wanna take the time on that first photo to really kind of explain all of the, the major principles that I'm thinking about when I'm editing my black and white street photography, and then you can apply that however you want to the images that you are out and making. So with that, let's jump into photo number one. So I've gone ahead and created sort of just a baseline image um, that is based on the original. 
And we're going to start with this image here. Now I've already copied the crop because I knew that um, that was the crop that I liked. So you can see here, um, this photo was made on my Leica M10R. It was made in uh, December. It was made on a 28 millimeter lens. You can see here it was 1 60th of the second. My aperture was 3.4 and I had a pretty high ISO. Um, now, if we jump into the edit, obviously the first thing that I wanna do is convert this image from color into black and white. So for me, that is going into uh, the color profiles and selecting Adobe Monochrome. You may have some other options in the profiles available to you based on the camera that you use. So for example, you know, Fuji cameras, I think have different black and white options. Canon have different black and white options. Um, I usually stick to the Adobe Monochrome because it's consistent uh, regardless of the camera that you're using. So once I've done that, you can see that we've got a black and white image, but it is relatively flat. It does not have the same sort of punch and feel that the final image was that I showed you. It's very um, sort of clean. The light and the uh, you know outlines of the buildings are relatively sharp, et cetera. Now, my workflow uh, typically starts with some simple corrections. So if this were an image that were you know, really off kilter, I might look at applying some geometry. Um, to me, to my eye, this one looks about right. So I'm not going to apply any geometry to this particular image. Um, I actually also tend to really like images that are slightly sort of a skewer off center, almost a Dutch angle. That's not this image, but just to say that typically the first place that I'm looking um, is at the crop, which I've mentioned I've, I've cropped it in just a little bit already to match the final image. Um, and then I'm looking at the geometry, which just allows me to you know, straighten the uprights or find the horizon line and make it level if I need to. I'm typically always using um, these functions when I import from my camera into Lightroom, I'm automatically having Lightroom, you know, try and remove any chromatic aberration, which is what that CA stands for, as well as applying any lens correction. So depending on the lens, especially if you get, you know, more wide angle lenses, 28 and greater, you can get some distortion around the outsides or even some vignetting. And Lightroom has some built-in uh, lens profiles that corrects for some of that um, as you need it. If I were to turn this off, you can see in this particular case, it doesn't make a very significant difference, but on some lenses, especially Especially wider lenses, it does make a difference. So I typically always have those on. Um, in very rare cases, do I not have it on? So I, I typically start with that. Now the next place that I go is always light. Uh, for me, the sort of exposure of the image and the balance um, of highlights and shadows and whites and blacks and the overall contrast are the most important thing to getting the image right. Now, of course, I'm always trying to do this as close as possible in camera, but stylistically, we're moving from a digital camera, in this case, my Leica M10R, to trying to create an image that feels a little bit more analog or filmic in the finished product. So there's a little bit of work that we need to do to take off some of the edge and extreme dynamic range that you can get in the really amazing you know, modern digital sensors like you have in the Leica M10R, the Leica M11. I also have a Canon R5 that's you know fantastic and really most of the modern digital cameras. So the exposure on this actually looks pretty good to me. I'm not going to adjust that um, you know, right off the bat. I may come back to it, but to my eye, this actually looks like a fairly well exposed image. Now I've just turned on the histogram on the top left hand side and you can see that um, generally, even though this is a slightly darker image, you can see that um, sort of the, the chart up there is sort of um, weighted to the left. There's still plenty of um, there's still plenty of data throughout the entire um, histogram there. So to me, this is fairly balanced. If I were to slide the exposure all the way down, you can see that it really um, pushes all those values to the left hand side versus if I were to slide it all the way up to the right, it um, you know pushes them all the way to the right. But for me, this feels pretty much balanced for the vibe that I'm trying to go for. It was you know, early evening, it was getting darker. I wouldn't want an image that feels like it was taken in the middle of the day because that's when it was not taken. So given that the exposure on this one feels pretty right, one of the first things that I typically do is I add a little bit of contrast. You know, in this particular case, it doesn't feel like it needs a whole lot of contrast. Um, you know, there are images where sometimes I'll pull it up to, you know, 15 or 20. In this particular case, I'm going to put it at, you know, about five, just as like a starting point. And I can always tweak it later if I need to. 
Now, the biggest thing that I'm usually looking at is actually the balance between highlights and shadows. Now, this particular photo, because we're working with, you know, sort of steam coming from the grate underneath this guy as he's walking, and we're looking at sort of a cloud that goes upwards um, into the space between these two sets of buildings as you look down the street, I want to emphasize that there is a really bright kind of hazy set of light, but also that obviously this was taken, you know, as we're moving towards night, so the shadows are important. I typically, um, in most of my images, look to create balance between these two things so that it never feels too heavy black or too heavy white in either direction. Now, on this particular image, I'm going to sort of eyeball this and look at the um, way that moving the highlights up a bit start to increase the, the look and density of the white in um, the image itself. So pushing this up to about 20 gives me a little bit more definition in the steam that's going upwards from the guy, as well as sort of emphasizing it a little bit more around his feet. Now, one of my sort of go-to tricks is that if I'm pushing highlights up, I'm typically pushing shadows down or vice versa. Now, there are exceptions to this, um, but generally, if I'm trying to maintain a good sense of balance, I'm typically looking at moving them in opposite directions. Now, in this particular case, if I were to start to pull the shadows down, you know, it's making a bit of a difference. It's not darkening the image too much. You can see the Histogram on the top left-hand side starting to shift a little bit, but if I literally put this at a plus 20 for highlights and minus 20 for shadows, the image still feels and looks balanced to me, but there's a little bit more contrast between the highlights and the shadows. The next place to go, and this works similarly, is the whites and the blacks. When I start to play with the whites and the blacks, it's more about luminance. So this is about brightening or you know, increasing the intensity of the whites in the image. And you can see it's relatively subtle as I'm sliding this up here. Um, so you know, if I'm starting to push the whites up, because again, one of the things that I really want to emphasize in this image is that sense of steam. If I move this all the way up to like 50 or so, that's giving me a really strong sense of the white coming from the steam. So that whole center of the frame that you can see, the steam around the guy, the steam going up into the sky, you get a much stronger sense of it as opposed to the image beforehand when it's not quite as obvious that that's what's happening. Now, if I deepen the blacks, again, I'm gonna move in the opposite direction to make sure that any of the blacks that I have in the image are not going to be totally, you know, sort of washed out by increasing those whites. So I'll typically move that again in the opposite direction um, if I've moved the whites up. So, you know, if I'm moving the highlights up, I'm typically moving the whites up. If I'm moving the shadows down, I'm typically moving the blacks down for an image like this at this time of day or with this type of lighting. You know, it's, it was soft, end of day, cloudy lighting, um, a cold month where um, there was a lot of humidity in the air, so the steam starts to, you know, sort of have a body of its own as it's in the air. The next place I could be looking is also at the tone curve. Um, typically, I have a couple of different tone curves that I use. I actually have these set as a preset for myself so that I can be consistent. Um, I have a couple that I use depending on the different situations. So I have sort of standard S curve. I've got a bit more of a, a matte black, which is kind of crushing those blacks, you know, as was really popular a couple of years ago. I have um, a grayed out version of that that's um, even crushed more and then a slightly darker version of that. And you know, these all probably look relatively similar on the screen, but I use them for different purposes. You know, for this particular image, I think we'll probably go with the flat matte. Um, and the reason for that is if I click on the grade matte blacks here, I feel like it pulls up too much shadow detail around this guy's leg and makes the blacks look a little bit artificial. So I'm gonna go with this sort of flatter version. And you can see, if I look at the tone curve here, it's essentially an S curve, but I've added an extra point down in the shadows to pull that up you know, just a tiny, tiny bit more and add a little bit more detail into the shadow area, but not enough that it, it feels, at least to my eye, as artificial. So once we've got sort of the, the light section um, you know, really set. The next thing that you can do is look at color. Now, white balance is important in any image. Um, 
it, it does a different thing when you're editing black and white images than it does when you're editing a color image. In a color image, it literally changes, you know, the, the tone and the look and feel of the image. You know, it changes it from being a tungsten balanced, which is gonna be warm, to sunlight, to, you know, clouds, etc. They all have different Kelvin values or, or temperatures of light. Um, when you're shooting in black and white, um, the same thing happens, but because you can't see the colors, what it actually does is it, it really, to my eye, affects the relationship between different colors. So you can see here as I'm moving it to a colder, a colder temperature, it's emphasizing those whites. If I move it to a warmer temperature, it also emphasizes the whites, but in a different way. So I'm actually in this particular image gonna pretty much just leave the white balance alone. You can do it sort of in as shot, which is typically where I go to um, when I'm editing my black and whites. You can tweak this based on different profiles that Lightroom has built in, and those are temperatures that are automatically built. However, under the color tab, you do have what's called the gray mix. And this, when you edit color on a black and white image, um, you obviously look at this and are saying, well, there's no color here. But you know, a black and white image is still made of color. The film, the, the digital sensor is still interpreting color and the way that the light is reflecting off of those different colors and coming towards the quote unquote eye of the camera. So if you want to affect the different tonality of the image, this is the place that you can do it. So, you know, if I'm looking to um, increase the um, you know sense of brightness of the steam, for example, I can select this little thing and tab on it and it will tell me which colors I would want to adjust. If I wanted to adjust the street themselves, I could push there and I would know exactly what colors to be using. Now, if there were areas in this image that I really wanted to um, highlight on increasing, I could do that here. So for example, again, we want that steam. So do I want to increase up the luminance of that steam. Now you can see it here. If I take it out, I decrease that, it really removes a lot of the pop of this image. So if I increase it, this is another way of adding sort of contrast because it's directly about the way that the orange light is hitting the sensor of the camera. Um, so a really good way in an image like this is to find the thing that you're trying to emphasize and then looking at the balance. So I'm just gonna push this up maybe about you know 20% to give a little extra pop to the steam itself. Now, under the effects tab, there's really only one main thing that I look at here. And this is something that I do on pretty much every image. Because I don't like overly digital images, I like a slightly softer look one of the things that I actually normally apply as part of my import of any digital image into my editing software is I immediately reduce the clarity of the image between 10 and 20%. And this just softens things a little bit. Now, if you're a landscape photographer, et cetera, some people would say, you know, let's increase the clarity. You know, it really kind of gives it a little bit of that like Instagram pop, for example. You can see that if I put it up, you know, it really, it really starts to pop a little bit. But I find that to my eye, that typically looks a little bit artificial compared to how film would be rendering the image. We've got a lot of contrast in the image based on the colors and the differences between the highlights and the shadows, but I don't want that super, super, super crispy, sharp, 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 sharp edge on every single thing within the photo. So I'm typically decreasing the clarity, you know, anywhere from um, 10 to 20. Um, you can also do the same thing with dehaze. You can increase or decrease. This is a tool that you have to be really careful with, especially if you're adding um, or increasing, you know, the dehaze value up to, you know, 17, 18. In the case of this image, the last thing that we would wanna do is dehaze it because the whole point of this image is to capture the haze of that steam. So in this particular case, we can actually think about decreasing um, the dehaze value into negative territory because it's going to further emphasize the sort of dreaminess of the light. Now, this is overkill, but just as, as an example of the power of dehaze from a negative standpoint, when you're looking at really soft light um, and you know haze, steam, fog, etc., this is a really way to emphasize further the quality of that. The thing about the effects tab is you have to be really um, cautious about overdoing it. If you overdo any one of these in any direction, it starts to look really, you know, amateur and beginning and not
sort of natural. The whole, the whole point of the way that I'm editing this photo and showing you how I do it is to try and make it look as though it was taken on film where you don't really have the ability to um, edit a lot of the values that we're looking at here. Now, of course, um, if we're talking about film, uh, grain is a big part of film. I tend to like fairly grainy images and the, the film that I shoot um, tends to uh, lead with grain in a lot of ways. Um, but again, you have to be careful adding this here because digital grain is not the same as actual film grain. Um, it just doesn't look quite the same. Now, because this was shot you know, in um, less light, this was shot in a scene where I know that um, if I were to be shooting this on film, it would probably be a pretty grainy image. I feel comfortable you know, kind of going for it and adding a fair amount of um, grain to the image because I know that if I had shot this at night, um, I would be doing that. I will often look at um, masking in and shaping the light. Now, one of the reasons that I do this is it allows me to further emphasize um, different pieces of the image. And there are different masks available in Lightroom. Um, typically, one of the first ones that I go to is a radial gradient, but you can also use the brush or the linear gradient to do very similar things. For me, in the case of this particular image, I have a couple things that I want to do. The first thing I want to do is really focus on the sort of area around his feet and the steam. And this is where I kind of lean into a lot of the things that we've already done. Now, I, I like to have the overlay on, at least at first, so I can see what I'm doing, but you can turn this off um, sort of once you get into the edit. But what I'm gonna be doing here is I want to further emphasize the whites of this particular section, further emphasize the highlights, um, but even more importantly, I want to go back into that effects tab and probably decrease the clarity on just this section even a little bit more. Um, I will probably add another uh, radial gradient to this. So you can see here if you just push the little um, plus tab, um, I will probably do a vertical one like this. And often what I'm doing in many of my images is I'm actually inverting them. So you can see here that if I click on this little um, sort of tab on the bottom right, you can invert it. And what this does is it's going to apply whatever it is that I'm adding to this um, gradient only into the red areas. So in this particular case, this is where I may come back to the exposure and drop the exposure of the image down just a little bit on the outside of that gradient to further emphasize that the area that we care about is all of this sort of like yummy, dreamy, hazy light in the center of the frame. Um, you can drop the shadows down a little bit. Um, I, again, you know, do all of this sort of carefully and don't overdo any of it, but the point is to really focus the viewer's eye in. So this looks about right to me. Okay, so this next photo that I'm gonna jump through in, in two minutes is you know, pretty quick. This is a pretty well exposed photo. You can see that it was um, taken at a very different time of day. So you know, as a street photo, this was you know, late afternoon in the same way that the first photo was, but there is not a cloud in the sky. It's super well lit, it was bright. So you can see that we probably need to edit this a little bit differently. So I'm gonna jump in here now and apply one of my presets real quick and then do a couple of quick edits to kind of get us you know, into a place that's similar to the last image. So the first thing I'll do is I pop in and I have these presets that I've built for myself. I've named them for different times of the day based on the photos that I originally built them off of. So you can see golden hour, dusk, you know, sort of a high noon. I've got a portrait one. I've got one based on, you know, steam heat at dusk that was very similar to the photo that we just edited. I think for um, this particular image, for this photo, I'm gonna do a high noon sun because I know that there's a lot of light here. Um, so I'm gonna click that, but clearly there's there's some issues here. So first of all, I need to do a little bit of a healing because I had some dust on the sensor. Um, but outside of something like that, let's get in here and look at the light. So I think this needs to be brightened up just a little bit. I think the contrast is fine, but I'm actually gonna pull the shadows up on this a little bit because I know that you know this, this woman here, there's detail in her um, clothing that I would be able to capture regardless of the type of photo. So I'm gonna actually pull the, the blacks up a little bit and the whites down a little bit. So again, I'm trying to maintain that sense of sort of reciprocal balance between the whites and the blacks. Um, I could pull the, the highlights up or down a little bit in here. I'm just gonna leave them alone in this particular case. 
In terms of the detail, I'm not gonna touch that, but I am gonna pop into the effects. Now you can see built into this preset, I've got a little bit of texture, I've got a little bit of negative clarity. I'm gonna drop this down even more. There's so much light in the scene that it's making the lines very, very crisp. I'm going to dehaze, you know, negative 10, kind of leave that where that's at. I might pop this vignette back up a little bit because I've got a clear blue sky. I don't want the vignetting to be so obvious. You know, it looks really unnatural. So maybe just a very, very, very subtle one. Um, and importantly, I'm gonna be looking at the grain here. So this is um, a very bright image. Grain is gonna really stand out. So I'm gonna actually increase the size of the grain on this one a little bit um, up to, it looks like I've got, you know, sort of, um, let's say maybe 35, 36. Um, I'm gonna leave the, the amount of grain at 50, but I may even increase the roughness a little bit. And I think that that's probably about it. Okay, one final image here. So you can see that this was a pretty colorful image. It was well lit. I'm gonna pop in here and same as the last time, apply uh, one of my presets. Now the final image I know had a lot of contrast. So that was, I think maybe the high noon one that I was, that I was using. Now, when I photographed this originally, um, it was kind of the middle of the afternoon and it was you know fairly well lit. So there's probably not a ton that we have to do here. So I'm just gonna check the light. If I look at the histogram here, it feels pretty well exposed. I think contrast is right. I might pull the highlights up just a little bit more. Um, I think that the shadows, the whites and the blacks all feel pretty good to me. Now this is an image where I could play with the gray mix a little bit because if you recall, there's a lot of color in the background image. So if I wanted to, you know, bring up some of the, the reds or the whites, you can see how it's affecting the sign in the bottom um, sort of left of the image there. So I will probably kind of pull this up a little bit to the right so that you can see that there is um, some writing on the wall there. Um, Let's see, what are some other colors that I want to look at? Maybe the blue of the handle looks like it could maybe, you know, come up or come down. Um, yeah, not, not a ton to do. I'm actually going to pull, pull some of this blue down so that the, uh, the handle doesn't appear quite so washed out. Um, you know, so I think for color, we're looking pretty good. Now, texture, clarity, all of the effects. Um, this is a pretty contrasty image, so I'm going to pop this down a fair amount. Now, obviously, I've got a slightly, um, you know, softer image here, um, you know, so I want to make sure that I'm emphasizing that by pulling the clarity down. It, there is a, a texture to the image, both in um, all of the sort of suds that are on the window, as well as, um, you know, just kind of the texture of the photo itself. A little bit of vignette here is okay. I might actually add a tiny bit more in this case, just to further emphasize um, sort of the, the suds in the middle. And then the other thing I'm gonna look at is grain. So the preset has it at 50, um, but I think that the grain can be larger in this particular case. Obviously the image has a little bit of a motion blur to it. So the grain is gonna add a little bit more texture to that. Um, I think that the the roughness of the grain is probably better a little bit on the chunkier side as well, really adds to the, the grittiness of the image. And that's probably about it. Um, you know, we can pop the, the grain up a little bit, but as a finished product, I mean, I think that that probably looks pretty good. So I hope that was useful, educational, informative. Uh, remember, all of this is subjective. This is just how I edit my black and white street photos. It's gonna vary depending on your personal tastes, the look that you're going for, and even the camera that you use to some degree. The way that the Leica M10R, which is what I shoot all of my street photography on, renders images differently than a Sony camera, different than my Canon R5, different than you know all different types of cameras. So you know all of this is meant to be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt. I hope that going through that first photo in a much deeper dive at least gave you a sense of the things that I'm thinking about when I'm editing my photos. And those second two were just, you know, all about once you sort of define the look that you're looking for, you can build presets for yourself, you know, use other images that you've taken that you really like and that you've got some bang and edit and make a preset off of that. And you can start to use that foundationally to build a new set of presets for yourself to be going to anytime you're in a similar editing situation as that other photo that you took in the past. So this was all hopefully informative. If you liked the video, you learned something, please consider giving the video a like. It would be amazing if you would subscribe to the channel. It really helps. I 
Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next week in the next video. Thank you.